slowed a little bit. So um, I guess I'll start. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first event in our Classics Reconnected seminar series. We're very glad that you were able to join us tonight. And um, before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to mention that this talk is being recorded and uh, there will also be a 15 minute Q&A afterwards. So if you have any questions, feel free to just pop them in the chat. And when we get to them, you're more than welcome to unmute and turn off your cameras. So like ask your questions sort of in person. <laughs> uh, but however, uh, during the talk, uh, it would be great if you could, if everybody could uh, make sure that their mics are muted and that their cameras are turned off just so it's um, easy to see Jenny's presentation. Um, anyways, now that that's taken care of, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening. So Professor Jin Yu Lu has um, trained in both China and the United States, and she's received her PhD in Roman history from Columbia University and is professor of classical studies at DePaul University. Professor Lu's research interests include social relations in Roman cities, the non-elite in the Roman Empire, Latin epigraphy, the reception of Greco-Roman classics in China, as well as translating classical texts in a global context. Her monograph, Collegia Cantonariorum, the Guilds of Textile Dealers in the Roman West was published by Brill in 2009, and her book, An Introduction to the Study of Roman History in Chinese, was released by Peking University in 2014 and reprinted in 2016. Her published articles range from those on Latin inscriptions, the ancient associations to receptions of Virgil in China, and Chinese translation of and commentary on Ovid. Um, she was recipient of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's New Directions Fellowship from 2014 to 20, or sorry, 2011 to 2014, and also a Low Classical Library Foundation Fellowship from 2018 to 2019. She's held a distinguished guest professorship at Shanghai Normal University since 2014, and she regularly organizes events in collaboration with the Guangxi International Center for Scholars of Shanghai Normal University. She's currently the principal investigator of translating the complete corpus of Ovid into Chinese with commentaries, which is a multi-year project sponsored by a National Science Fund of China major grant. Um, anyways, enough for me. Uh, please take it away, Professor Wu. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for uh, coming from all over the world. Um, uh, I need to share, oh, play from the start. Can you all see the screen clearly? Great, thank you. And it's, uh, it's my tremendous honor to be part of the uh, Classics uh, Reconnected um, se uh, series. Thank you for the uh, invitation. And today I'm going to talk about lessons from Rome, some Chinese perspectives in the early 20th century um, my chronological limit is um, between 1900 and uh, 1930s-ish. And um, I will not be focusing on professional uh, Roman historians. As a, mat as a matter of fact, uh, professionalization of the study of Roman history uh, did not take place until uh, later in the 20th century in China. Right? But um, my focus will be on the uh, thinkers, reformers, uh, opinion leaders. They had a huge impact on the reformation of the Chinese society in the uh, 20th century, uh, which in fact made them uh, even more important than professional <laughs> Roman historians, um, at least in a way. I, but before uh, I talk about the specifics, uh, we will take a quick look at the historical context um, because without this information, it will be very difficult to understand um, why uh, the opinion leaders said what they said. Right, so um, basically China was in bad shape um, at that time, right? Um, it was defeated by the British, it was defeated by the French, defeated by uh, the Japanese, um, by Japan. So um, before the beginning of the 20th century, uh, China had already suffered a series of national defeats. And um, in 1905, and there was this abolition of the imperial examinations um, system, which was based on the Confucian canon. And uh, that was a, a shock uh, to a lot of the people who were engaged in the study of Confucianism. 
And this had a lot of um, consequence, one of which uh, was the uh, historicization of Confucianism, um, uh, which turned uh, Confucianism into a scholarship rather than living, um, a sort of living uh, doctrine, uh, or uh, the principles for ruling um, the country. And uh, in 1912, uh, we saw the abdication of the last emperor. So the dynastic era was over, right? And in the same year, we saw the establishment of a republic with elected um, uh, officials, with the elected presidents. Um, but uh, that did not solve a lot of the systemic, uh, systemic problems of China, um, which um, of course, uh, resulted in all sorts of waves of cultural movements, uh, political movements, um, and those were entangled with uh, further hard time, um, including war, uh, wars between warlords and the Sino-Japanese War, and then World War II. Um, eventually, uh, peace came. It was uh, with the establishment of the uh, People's Republic of China, that is uh, the, the uh, current day um, um, China. Um, so that was the uh, quick um, rundown of the background uh, to my discussion of um, how the uh, Chinese intellectuals saw Roman history in the early uh, 20th century. And their agenda, they had a lot of things on hand, of course, right? Um, so what was the agenda for the Chinese opinion leaders, reformers, et cetera? Of course, they had to identify problems and then try to uh, fix the problems. And if they could not fix the problems, at least they could propose ways to fix problems, right? Um, so they borrowed a lot of theories from the West. Um, some of the theories um, are, um, problematic nowadays, but um, those were the uh, reigning theories at that time, including social Darwinism, including eugenic theories and ranking of civilizations and so on, right? And uh, geographic determinism. Uh, in this process, uh, one thing that we should um, note and remember is that there was a complicated relationship between um, those Chinese opinion leaders and thinkers with the West. Um, I had a quotation mark around the West because it was a fluid um, concept, but the, uh, the Chinese intellectuals used the concept regardless. Um, uh, in what ways the relationship was complicated? Um, the uh, Chinese intellectuals subscribed to a lot of their thinkings at that time. Um, but um, they also resisted uh, the West and some of the theories. So the West was seen as both invaders and teachers. The West was the target of resistance, um, but they also provided, they were also suppliers of language and concepts for the Chinese opinion leaders. They, they needed, they needed the language to talk about the problems in the Chinese society at that time, right? So they couldn't, uh, they couldn't get rid of the West, uh, the Western um, uh, concepts, ideas and uh, languages and, and so on and theoretical frames. Um, so you would see uh, relentless self-orientalization -orient uh, at that time. Those reformers and intellectuals had such harsh uh, self-criticism and self-censorship. Um, I'll provide some examples here. Okay, so um, the way they defined China and the Chinese uh, was one of the examples, of course. How did they define um, the Chinese past? They defined it negatively uh, by what was supposedly missing from its history as measured against the West. So what was missing? according to them, a whole range of things, including epics, tragedy, democracy, and they actually personified democracy and called uh, it Mr. De, <laughs> and logic, philosophy, religion, scientific spirit, a whole bunch of things. Um, according to them, those were all missing from the Chinese past. 
uh, they also uh, personified the scientific spirit and called by calling it Mr. Sai. And that was the uh, initial of, um, of the English word science. Um, and what about the Chinese people? Um, so there is a whole list of how bad um, they were, right? Um, and these were the words that they chose to describe the Chinese at that time. Um, inertia, timidity, complacency, apathy, hesitation, deference, dejection. And um, some of these words are still being used today, right? Um, so they, um, as you can see here, they were really, really harsh towards themselves and towards um, their fellow Chinese. Um, but the purpose of uh, orientalization here, of course, is different. Self-orientalization is different from the imperialistic um, orientalization or orientalism because the, the imperialistic orientalism, um, the purpose of that was to legitimize conquest, right? Um, was to say that you guys are just um, below us, right? Um, but um, self-orientalism, uh, the purpose of that was to uh, revive the nation. Um, so they had to uh, sort of put down <laughs> their people first and then uh, and talk about them in very harsh terms and then try to find ways uh, find ways to um, fix the problems. And, and so this is their, their route, right? They exaggerate uh, the problem, exaggerate the seriousness of the problem, of course, and then try to... Uh, uh, make people alert of uh, those problems and then um, find ways to fix problems. And some of the uh, um, intellectuals that we will be talking more about today, for example, Liang Qichao, in 1901, he had a treatise called The Origins of China's Weakness. And here you see the invention of the Chinese national character, right? He said, there were two bad things about um, the, the Chinese national character. Um, and these were some of the uh, reasons for uh, China's weakness, um, servility, ignorance, self-centeredness, insincerity, uh, insincerity, timidity, inertia, and, and, and so on. Right, um, pretty harsh. And, <laughs> And that was, of course, um, you know, one of the reasons why um, why uh, the uh, Chinese intellectuals turned to uh, the Greco-Roman past uh, because they saw a lot of heroes in Greek and Roman history, especially Greek history. And there was a wave of translating Greek tragedy, for example, and um, people wrote sonnets for Greek um, playwrights and for Greek tragedies. They wanted someone like Prometheus. Um, Prometheus as a, was a metaphor for enlightenment um, because he's still fire for human uh, for the human world, and Prometheus also sort of sacrificed himself um, um, by um, his enlightening um, deed. All right, so you see this turn to uh, the West, right, including and uh, the Greco-Roman um, past. Um, so then you would have the question about uh, whether those Chinese thinkers was just being naive. Uh, did they truly think that the West was um, a loyal uh, ally, was, an, uh, was a good ally? Um, in fact, no, um, they were in the know, uh, those Chinese thinkers. Uh, for them, the West, uh, there was this instrumentalism approach to to the West, what do I mean by it? Um, I will just use one example to illustrate um, how uh, the Chinese thinkers could uh, and were actually being very manipulative uh, in a good sense. Um, the example I'm going to use is the debate on whether to translate Oswald uh, Spengler's uh, The Downfall or the Decline of the West, right? And this was first published in 2000. Eight and um, it was um, completely published in, uh, uh, sorry, 1918, and it was completely published in the 1920s. Um, that was the German version, right? So um, we have this um, reformer, one of the reformers and one of the leading thinkers at that time who studied in Germany, his name is Trim Mai Zhang. 
And there was a debate between um, him and his uh, fellow students in Germany about whether to introduce the book to China or not, whether to translate it or not. He advised against translating the book. Why? Um, so he said to one of the student, fellow students uh, who wanted to translate the book. So once this book enters China, uh, I'm translating uh, Mai Zhang here, our country's arrogance and pomposity will surely increase. They will surely say, and they here um, refer to the more conservative mind in the Chinese society at that time. They will surely say, look, the Europeans will fall on hard time. Our privilege in inactivity or constants is surely better. And our Confucian principles are better, uh, superior. Um, so uh, his advice against translating um, uh, Spengler's the downfall of the West was not to save the reputation of the West. Um, his purpose, of course, was to, um, to make sure that the new culture movement will be able to move forward. Um, so he thought translating the book would do a disservice to uh, the Chinese reformation movement because it would boost the uh, confidence of the conservative, the more conservative people, right? So he was saying, if this belief is lost, uh, what is this belief? Um, this belief is that uh, the European scientific methods and social movement are sort of sufficient for correcting the deficiencies of our old civilization, right? So that was the uh, belief that um, he and the like-minded people held at that time. Um, but if that was compromised, uh, not only with the civiliza civilization of our country, never have any chance of revival, but the contact between the West and uh, the East will be obstructed and delayed. Okay, so he advised against uh, not translating Spengler's book, although he, he knew that since the book uh, was already out and eventually it will enter, it, was, um, it, will, um, it would enter China. And I use this example to show that those people were truly in the know, all right? Um, and they selectively choose things from the West to boost their own agenda, to boost their own um, enterprise, right? And I have another, another examples here, um, you know, that shows that those people were not, you know, naive, uh, uh, um, thinkers um, who uh, naively uh, believed in uh, the so-called Western civilization. Um, here we have uh, Qi Chao Liang again, um, and he wrote this in 1905. And this was actually about um, the French uh, dominance in uh, Vietnam. So um, he was saying the civilization of the European countries, sorry, European countries today all originated um, uh, from Rome. During the heyday of Rome, it plundered uh, the lives and wealth of people of the colonized places to glorify its own metropolis um, in order to, uh, to order them around with arrogance. Roman civilization was in fact the crystallization, and this is my literal translation of his Chinese, of the wronged blood, uh, the bitter and the bitter tears of numerous human beings. Um, so yeah, they knew, <laughs> they knew, right? Um, but they needed the West for the, uh, for the, for the language that um, it could supply, All right? So then um, returning to their own agenda, how to rescue and rejuvenate China. Um, and of course they would look for historical lessons, right? Um, is religion the answer, for example? Um, and what caused the current problems? Um, should we blame internal causes or external causes? Okay, so they turn to all sorts of history, including Roman history. And one type of history that they were fascinated with, of course, was the uh, tragic falls of various countries in the world. And they had a comprehensive catalog. 
you know, Korea, Egypt, Vietnam, Poland, Carthage, and so on. And of course, Rome, right? And in the history lesson book, Rome sort of stood out. Why? Because, um, for, well, for two reasons, at least. Uh, Rome was thought of to be most comparable to China in terms of size, achievements, and influence. Um, and this is ancient Rome, of course. And the further dimension that made Roman history uh, peculiar uh, was that the fall of Rome was thought of by the Chinese um, intellectuals as the context at, against which nationalism rose, nation um, states um, rose. Well, you may quibble about this, but um, but they um, but it, this was very important uh, to them because one of their uh, agenda was to establish a nation country, a true nation state. Uh, what, I do, what do they mean by that? We'll um, talk about that in due course. Um, but first, what were the sources for their understanding of Roman history? Right? Um, they had all sorts of information sources, but I have to say that general textbooks, uh, Montesquieu and Gibbons, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, those were some of the major sources and in terms of the uh, textbooks, the survey, uh, they usually came from the Protestants, uh, the protest, uh, Protestant missionaries in China. They published all sorts of world histories and the title of them, as you can see in the, uh, well, the, the Chinese title, uh, title actually uh, translates into uh, the general history of uh, tens of thousands of countries. <laughs> that means uh, world history, All right? So what did they say? What did those textbooks say or general survey say about Roman history? Um, and here I have an example about Roman social history. And it was written by a Protestant missionary from Finland. And it was actually well read by the Chinese at that time, you know, the reading, um, the reading community. Uh, he said, basically, uh, the Romans rose through conquest, of course, and then um, he blamed the Greeks for corrupting um, <laughs> Rome, for corrupting the Romans because they brought uh, luxury and uh, promiscuous living, uh, living um, style. And Christianity rose to glorify and revive Rome, uh, but it was too late to rescue a decayed society. Um, so that was his general um, gist. And that was, uh, in fact, a common, um, common story line or narrative in the uh, um, survey uh, books. And there was uh, also another very popular uh, textbook called um, a Short History of Rome. It was translated from Creighton's uh, History of Rome. Right? And it was published numerous times. And uh, most recent uh, edition was published in 2014. And this was, of course, for um, the purpose of historical, uh, for the purpose of examining um, this fossilized uh, text. Uh, and it also praised um, Christianity. It was included in uh, the Western Learning History Primers, uh, the 16 Western Learning uh, Primers, uh, which was uh, one of the major sources for Western learning for the uh, uh, Chinese reading community um, in the early 20th century. Right. So what did it say about Christianity is that, um, and I quote directly from the English version, you see then how great a change Constantine made. He was very much helped in making it by the fact that he had become a Christian and people were so glad to have Christianity set up as the religion of Rome that they uh, looked with favor on, um, sorry, on all that, Sorry, my view was kind of blocked by the uh, by the little window that shows uh, the gallery. Um, people were so glad to have Christianity set up as the religion of Rome that it looked with favor on all that Constantine did. So it was very optimistic about um, uh, the function of Christianity um, in the Roman society, right? So then 
Um, how did the Chinese react to uh, that aspect of Roman history? Is religion then the answer for reviving um, Chinese? And I will quote from um, him alone, um, but he was kind of representative, right? The answer is no. Uh, so even though um, they saw a lot of um, um, emphasis on the function of religion, in the uh, general writings about uh, Rome, they decided that um, uh, converting to Christianity, turning China, the Chinese society into a Christian society would not solve the problem. And they gave very interesting reasons. Um, and again, you may completely disagree with what they said, but, um, but this is, um, and I would summarize, I will summarize uh, some of uh, what, um, some of the uh, key arguments he put forward. Uh, he ranked people, of course, this is Zhang Taiyan, one of the reformers. He ranked people and this ranking system came from the West as well, right? He um, ranked the Romans as civilized people. He ranked the Chinese as the civilized people as well, but he ranked the German, uh, the Germanic people at that time as barbarians. Um, they were below the Romans and they were thought of um, by him to be below the Chinese as well. So he said, um, religion um, can sort of uh, reform the barbarian people. All right, the Germanic race uh, who rose afterward had origin of being barbaric and lowly people. Um, so they could be civilized by religion. However, the civilized people could not be, um, could not gain much from religion. This is because in the case of Christianity, it could prove, improve civilization if the barbarians used it. Yet, if the civilized were to use it, they would regress into barbarism just take a look back at Romans, uh, Roman history. How splendid were the political life and scholarship back then that was before the rise of Christianity. After you, the use of Christianity, philosophy was not allowed. Free thinking was blocked to such an extent that scholarship was becoming weakened daily and the political life was declining daily. And as a result, Rome fell. So uh, to him, and to a lot of the like-minded people who were influenced, in fact, by Gibbon, um, Christianity was the cause, was at least one of the causes of Roman, um, of the downfall of the Roman uh, Empire because it um, compromised the freedom of thinking. Right? And he had other quibbles about um, the uh, utility of uh, utilitarianism of Christianity in, in the Chinese society at that time, because Christianity was closely associated with the West. So some of the Chinese, according to him, allied themselves with Christianity, not because they believed in Christianity, but because they wanted to, they wanted material benefits, they want tangible benefits from this alliance. All right, so, um, yeah, that was his argument. No, um, Christianity was not the answer and Rome provided the uh, uh, lesson from the past. Right? So if Christianity was not, if religion or any sort of religion, right, it was not the answer, uh, what would be the answer? Okay, so um, I uh, quote quickly, I sh um, I'm showing you quickly this, uh, short survey book. It, this was translated from Japanese. Um, and in the preface, the translator uh, was lamenting about something that was missing from the Chinese history, but was um, important throughout Roman history, according to him, which also was the cause uh, of why even Rome died um, some of the uh, uh, some of its traits didn't die, right? And this was uh, the uh, power of the so-called popular parties. He was talking about um, people, right? Um, he, in his comparison, the translator's comparison between China and Rome, they were comparable to each other in terms of their assimilative power. That is cultural. Uh, assimilative power, but um, there was something that Rome had that China did not had, 
uh, that is um, the popular parties will return to this point um, again. Um, but there is, uh, for, for the Chinese uh, thinkers at that time, there was the question of why, you know, why the Rome had those, uh, but China did not have um, them. And how, uh, how could China uh, achieve something like that, right? Um, and here uh, we'll talk about uh, this uh, person who might be familiar to some of you and, and his name uh, was Kang Yu Wei and he was one of the um, reformers uh, that was involved in overthrowing the Qing dynasty. Right? And he, during his exile, he actually visited Italy. Right? And what did he say about um, the Roman ruins? What did he say about Italy? We'll talk about that shortly. Um, but first I uh, wanted to uh, mention his approach to why the Chinese did not have uh, popular parties, why the Chinese did not have parliamentary system. And those were thought of as very important for reforming the Chinese society at that time. So he praised the Roman Senate as a stabilizing factor, uh, no matter what change, um, the Roman Senate was always there, right? Um, but uh, the lack of a parliamentary system in China was not because uh, the Chinese people was not intellectually uh, competent. It was um, for him because um, of geography, right? Um, so he looked at uh, Europe. He looked at, um, you know, very, he visited various places during his exile after his reformation, uh, the reformation that he, movement he was involved um, sort of failed. Um, in his observation, geography was a contributing factor in the rise of uh, parliamentary system and democracy. Islands and mountains proved to be obstacles for achieving unification, resulting in small countries with small populations. And democracy arose in places where the ruler had not been particularly elevated or far removed from the ordinary um, people. And this might sound familiar to you. And the aristocrats were competing for power, which made it difficult for monarchy to last long. Um, so he sort of found um, uh, rationale for why China had monarchy for so long. Um, but uh, the uh, more important keyword here is unification, right? So this is how he envisioned um, uh, the comparison between China and Rome. Um, during his visit to Italy in 1904, he actually gained some confidence uh, uh, with respect to Chinese history. Some of the indexes he used to measure uh, the level of civilization of Rome and China included uh, the palaces and the road system. Uh, in his observation, uh, he thought the Qing and Han, uh, Han, and that is early Chinese palaces, were far superior to Rome's. He visited the Palatine Hill and saw the, the, uh, the palaces. And he also said that the road in early uh, Qing dynasty, that was early China, of course, uh, were by no means inferior to, um, to Rome's. And so he gained some confidence there. And then um, he wanted to understand um, how um, sort of Rome did not um, last that long and what led to the downfall of, of uh, Rome and to him, it was division. And for him, it was Diocletian um, because he divided the empire into four uh, countries. And after the fall of Rome, there had been ongoing separatist wars and Rome perished forever. And um, eventually he said, wasn't it due to the absence of Confucius thought of great unification that, uh, that Europe was in such a state of strife, uh, such a state of strife. So this is his grand model uh, of historical development. Uh, so first unification, which would lead to prosperity, but prosperity also lead to division um, here he used sort of social Darwinism to understand division. 
he, uh, in his understanding, there was some benefit of the division because division would lead to competition, would encourage competition, and competition would lead to um, improvement or development of thinking, um, and uh, and would account for progress. But um, he said he would rather not to have division because the cost was too deep, steep, right? It was too costly because division led to, um, led to what? Led to the loss of uh, human lives, um, would lead to the burning of books, <laughs> would lead to destruction of all sorts of things. And so he, um, even though he, uh, would approve of social Darwinism, uh, Darwinism. He would approve of the benefits of competition. Uh, he would rather bypass uh, this stage. And um, from division, um, there would be fall. And uh, that would lead to further uh, strife, um, competition accompanied with violence, chaos, which again um, it would call for unification and eventually grant unification. So this is his model of historical development. Um, and he thought uh, the, um, uh, the, the Chinese did actually pretty well in the past um, because they did well with unification. And now they also need unification. And in his observation, he thought, um, at that time, the reason why Germany was kind of uh, a little, a little uh, um, ahead of Italy was because Germany achieved modern unification earlier than, than Italy. Okay, so his uh, agenda becomes um, focused on uh, unification, right? which means um, and he would have problem with uh, things like uh, local autonomy. And he would not have a huge problem uh, with having a monarch right? and having an emperor was not a huge problem so long as unification could be maintained. Right? So um, his model uh, was like this, right? These are his um, keywords. And again, um, he uh, uh, sort of privileged this, uh, his privilege in this model um, was also at least partly based on his observation of what happened to Roman history. Um, but his student who later became a sort of a rival to him uh, in, um, in, in various areas, he had a whole different sets of uh, key terms and he also turned to Roman history, right? Uh, so his key terms um, uh, were those, local autonomy, individual rights, political freedom, um, militarism, and this, uh, these words might be familiar to you. And these all came from enlightenment, right? Um, after, um, after enlightenment, um, but militarism, what did he mean? All right, so uh, let's uh, sort of go over um, what he wanted for China first. Uh, returning to this treatise on the causes of Rome's weakness, the origins of China's weakness, uh, written fairly early on. Um, he said there were two things that the Chinese did not know or did not differentiate, uh, three things that the Chinese did not differentiate and those were bad. Um, well, not differentiating them was bad. All right, first, there was no uh, differentiation between country and or under heaven, and that is the universe. Right, so uh, the Chinese only saw one country, and that is China, right? All the other so-called countries were uh, secondary. Right? They were um, marginal, they were para, para, uh, and they were, um, they were tribute paying um, inferior uh, existence. All right, um, so for them, there was only one country and that, uh, that would lead to all sorts of things and including the lack of patriotism because if there is only one country, how do you speak of patriotism um, and, and, and so on. And they did not uh, differentiate the state and the dynasty. 
um, so the state was actually private property of the uh, dynastic ruling families, right? And that was also related to the third uh, lack of differentiation. That is, there was no difference between the state, uh, no difference between, um, uh, there was no true citizens. There were only subject um, because there was, um, because they uh, did not figure out the relationship between the state and the people of the um, of the country. Right? The uh, um, the people did not belong to a country, right? The people belong to the private property of a dynastic family, um, whatever ruling dynastic family, and there was. So uh, one of his main agendas was to correct those uh, things um, in order to establish a nation state for, uh, for China. Um, so he wrote a, a whole series of high impact um, treaties, including this one. And this is, um, uh, there are different ways of translating the title and the doctrine of the new people or um, if you see the new as uh, a verb, uh, then this, uh, the title of this treatise can be translated into on renovating uh, the people. All right, so um, in it, there were a lot of discussions about Rome and I quote some of them here. Um, first of all, the importance of local autonomy and for him, uh, the Roman empire compromised local autonomy. Uh, local autonomy was destroyed and individual rights were compromised. While all effort, um, and he is still talking about the Roman Empire, was invested in expanding the power of the state instead of cultivating personality. Um, it's hard to translate this word. Um, this is like internal um, essence of human being, something along that line. And this is why in the last years of Rome, the corruption and vileness of the Latins became well known everywhere. Um, um, Latins is mentioned here because the so-called citizens of Rome were in fact only the Latin people in the metropolis, uh, while the conquered lands were not regarded at the same um, level. Um, so in his understanding, uh, the establishment of the Roman Empire was uh, the Latins um, spreading their power, right? But the Latins always remained the ruling clan, uh, the ruling people, uh, which led to the loss of local autonomy and um, individual, uh, individual rights. And you will quibble about all this, of course, and this um, storyline, <laughs> this narrative. Um, but this is something that he shared with his audience, right? And of course, his agenda was to uh, prove that local autonomy, um, it, it was important to maintain local autonomy so that um, your state uh, does not fall, right? And then he um, um, explained why uh, uh, Rome was not able to uh, eventually maintain um, its, uh, its rule. That was because um, it lost its vitality of the people. Uh, what is the vitality uh, of the people? Um, for him, it was actually the warrior spirit, the martial spirit. I translated the word shangwu into militarism, but it's a very bad translation. Um, the basic meaning of that term was, um, you know, uh, valuing um, warrior spirit. Um, why did he emphasize that? Um, that was because um, he wanted the people, uh, he wanted his new people, this new people to be of sound of both mind and body. And he saw a very weak, uh, physically, not only mentally weak um, people, um, but uh, physically weak people. And in order to uh, revive the uh, physical uh, strength and physical strength here is also a metaphor for the uh, strength of the nation, right? Um, um, he and a whole bunch of other people um, uh, sort of emphasize the importance of martial spirit. And this is different from, um, from uh, imperialistic militarism. 
um, but was a crucial part for establishing a new people in their in their imagination, right? And here he also used uh, social Darwinism um, without militaristic people. That is, um, people who uh, who do not lose the uh, warrior spirit. Um, and blood and iron policy, the founder of a nation would not be able to survive on the stage of fierce competition. He saw on the stage of the world, um, he saw the world as a stage uh, for fierce competition. And in order not for China to fall behind, um, uh, it had to, um, it had to not only um, have intelligent, um, people have uh, a large size of people and vast territory, but also uh, a people um, who, um, are sound in, uh, who are sound physically, right? Um, and the reason why Rome lost it, its empire because it completely lost um, all of these, uh, lost the vitality, lost um, martial spirit and so on, right? So um, there is a more, and that was um, that was in the uh, 19, uh, 19, early, still early uh, 1910s, right? Um, but then he thought uh, sort of shifted a little. He thought more about re the relationship between the state, the people and the culture, because so far um, the culture of traditional um, China, the traditional uh, culture of the Chinese past, um, has not been discussed yet. Where uh, where do we place it? Um, can we see? Uh, do we have um, precedents in history? Precedent in history. Um, can we learn something from um, history, including Roman history? Right. So there is this very interesting um, uh, writing by again him Liang Qichao in nineteen. 11, and this is a dialogue between two people. And Changjiang is in fact his own pen name, uh, pen name. So Changjiang's opinion sort of represents his opinion. And this dialogue is between him and a more conservative and uh, a, a, a worrying uh, Ming Shui, uh, that is uh, the other uh, Lakuta. And so this dialogue was more or less like a Socratic dialogue. And uh, the debate, uh, the issue of debate was whether China would fall or would eventually fall and how uh, optimistic or pessimistic uh, should we be about the future of uh, uh, China. Um, so Tang Jiang is very optimistic. Um, he basically says it will not fall. If we go back to um, Roman history, um, we will see that there is contrast between Rome and China. Um, and even, even if Rome fell, um, China would not. Um, and here is how he goes about um, uh, uh, rationalizing what he said. Right, so he cited Gibbon. Gibbon was a great historian, and this is said by Chang, Chang Jiang, um, who was um, his um, alter ego, um, who was actually himself. And Gibbon was a great historian from England. His The Rise and Fall, he got the title of the book wrong, and was read wherever there is a well in um, Europe. It says, um, so this is his version of uh, Gibbon said, right? Um, uh, and you might disagree with his representation of Gibbon, um, but this is what he gave the Chinese audience. After Rome um, had conquered Italy, its people lost their patriotism. And Chang Jiang has a note here um, saying, previously the Romans only had love for their city. It was not sufficient to speak of patriotism because the state had not been formed yet. So he's sort of trying to um, historicize the concept of patriotism. And then he continued to quote Gibbon. It was not that they did not love Rome, but what they loved was Rome's culture instead of the Romans and the Roman state. They took upon themselves the task to preserve and augment their culture as well as to spread it to the world. The Romans would grant power without any hesitation to wh whoever was able to fulfill these tasks, regardless of his ethnicity. That was why half of their half of the successive emperors of Rome came from alien ethnic groups. 
right? So he got something, um, he, he got some inspiration from this quote from Gibbon and that was his understanding of Gibbon, right? Um, and, and that is about, uh, the inspiration is about the importance of, uh, the importance of culture and then he had this uh, lengthy argument about um, the relationship between the uh, traditional uh, uh, Chinese culture um, and the future of China, right? So he says, our ancient sages teaching, and this is Liang um, in the voice of Tang Jiang, one of the locutors saying, um, teaching on cultivating oneself, putting family in order, governing the state and pacifying the world places the ultimate goal on pacifying the world. Therefore, the world relies on the state while the state relies on the family. The ancient sages of China, again, did not value particularly favoring one's own country under the heavens yet. What does pacifying the world mean? In Gibbon's words, that simply means to spread the culture of our ancestors to the world. So here there is a break, uh, breaking down of the boundary between uh, the state, the country and, um, and the culture. Um, so his thinking sort of shifted to culturalism in the, 19, uh, in the 1910s. And this does not mean, of course, he does not want a nation uh, state, but um, he does not place a boundary between this envisioned nation state and the uh, traditional culture, right? And Ming Shui was still worried, right? Um, and he, oh, and uh, the culturalism uh, of Liang Qichao was also connected with cosmopolitanism. Um, as I just mentioned, um, there was a breaking down uh, of the boundaries. Right? So Ming Shui, um, going back to Roman history, said that, oh, but there is danger of cosmopolitanism. Look, uh, Rome fell because of its cosmopolitanism, right? It didn't, uh, 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 it spread its own culture to um, all sorts of people, right? And also the empress came from different ethnic groups and so on. Um, so uh, that was Ming Shui's worry about the potential risk of cosmopolitanism. And then um, Tang Jiang uh, continued to argue, this indeed may be a concern, yet between us and Rome, the trajectories are not uh, exactly the same. After it prospered due to cosmopolitanism, Rome did not encounter hostile countries, but mere stateless barbarian tribes who entered to be placed under its protection. It's here referring to Rome. Um, since then, these tribes gradually grew as a result of which Rome became divided. Rome's division occurred internally. Its cosmopolitanism therefore made the elements within its boundaries drift away and disperse. The situation with us has been the opposite. Our cosmopolitanism has been the cause for harmony and unity. Therefore, even though it led to negative results for them, that is the Romans, it would generate positive results for us. Um, so this is um, his, argue, his argument for a, um, posi a positive and optimistic future of culturalism and um, cosmopolitanism. And he returned to why uh, uh, cosmopolitanism did not work for the Romans and uh, uh, and here again, um, the argument circles back to the issue of the national character. Right? And Tang Jiang says, if the national character is sufficient, that is if, if it's strong enough um, and the country is vast, no other countries can destroy it unless the people abandon their own national character. Right, the case in point is ancient Rome. So um, he was saying um, here, he, what he was emphasizing here was that a country would only fall due to internal causes, right? So if you want to strengthen a nation, a strengthen a, a country, um, self-strengthening uh, should, uh, should be prioritized. Don't blame, um, don't just blame external enemies. 
Okay. If you are strong enough internally, you will not be destroyed. That's, that's what he was trying to argue. Okay. So, um, so then we, we will see a lot of um, um, elaboration, subsequent elaborations of the national characters of the Romans, right? Um, for example, in those uh, stories, those were translated from uh, English versions, of course, um, famous stories, are retold 50 famous stories retold and there were also 30 famous stories retold um, from uh, from western history uh, tai shi here western history all right and some of those stories are very familiar to um, would be very familiar to many of you for example cornelia the story of the mother of the Graeci and um, Horatius who eventually, uh, who defended the bridge to the city of Rome and, uh, and who eventually jumped to the city, uh, to, to the Tiber River and so on, All right? Uh, so the national character of Rome was understood as uh, the character um, of the Romans in the Roman Republic, um, you know, Livy's Romans. And the Roman Republic was seen as a true Roman. And this of course goes back to, um, a lot of the uh, Western writers, right, um, including Montesquieu and other Enlightenment writers and writers from the uh, Romantic um, era. Uh, so how did they summarize the uh, national character of the Romans? Um, here I have an example of um, a survey of Roman history from the 1920s. Um, and the writer summarized the uh, Roman uh, national character this way. Simply put, the Roman, uh, the reason why Rome was able to govern the world is because it was able to obey first. Um, it taught humankind a tremendous lesson. That is, if a state could focus the might of the entire country on the public well-being instead of serving individual interests, the capability of the state would be boundless. And this is a great and valuable lesson uh, from Rome. Okay. Although Rome was from time to time overly brutal, uh, well, um, the second passage um, uh, would uh, make uh, some of us uncomfortable, um, but, um, um, but it was um, a general, uh, understanding of Rome's, uh, of Rome's role um, before the uh, early 20th century, um, uh, before mid uh, 20th century. Although Rome was from time to time overly brutal and cruel and lacking compassion, we should thank it for providing us with an everlasting contribution that is not only did it civilize the ancient world, smashing their barbarity, but it also laid uh, the foundation for modern countries by means of its credo of discipline and its victory due to discipline. Okay, so the emphasis on um, uh, discipline here, uh, this of course goes against um, uh, some of the uh, uh, national character traits that were, um, that I, sh uh, I showed early on in this uh, talk, uh, for example, um, the characterization of the Chinese people as self-centered, um, as only caring for themselves uh, without, um, without caring for the entire, uh, for the public or for the, um, for the state, for the well-being of the state. All right, so basically they were using the Romans to, you know, to supply sort of uh, what was missing, what they thought was missing from, um, from the national character of the, of the Chinese. I, so um, here, um, uh, additional uh, positive um, Roman national characters, um, the spirit of self-sacrifice. Okay. Originally, the Romans had conquered the world, that is the world in, in their eyes, by virtue of their serenity, simplicity, bravery, endurance, self-control, and peaceful discipline. 
and of course, I mean, um, reminiscing uh, about the Republican Romans, the uh, uh, Roman writers in the uh, imperial period would also say the same thing, similar or, or similar thing. But um, um, but my point here is that you see the contrast, right, between uh, this set of keywords um, and um, and the keywords that uh, the Chinese uh, thinkers listed uh, for the Chinese national character, right? Um, so it was the loss of this national character that led to the downfall of the Roman Empire. The spirit of self-sacrifice was corrupted by extravagance. Public welfare was suppressed by monarchs. The habit of the endurance was replaced by slaves. The bloodline of independence and self-esteem was mixed with sycophantic foreigners. All right, um, and again, nowadays, uh, we probably do not buy uh, this analysis, but again, that was um, their detour uh, to, uh, by which um, they envision uh, a new people for, for, uh, for, for China. Um, I could actually stop here, but I um, do want to mention um, some of the uh, turn um, of direction um, after the 1920s, because the agenda before the 1920s was um, the, uh, the building of a nation state um, was to sort of reform uh, the uh, national character. Uh, but after the uh, 1920s, the focus shifted a little. Um, it was more about uh, what should we do about uh, the country economically um, how do we revive a prosperous um, uh, country? All right, so the attention sort of turned to the economic explanation, the financial explanation of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And so um, in this article from 1933, three reasons were listed as the uh, um, reasons for the fall of Rome and uh, similar, similar, similar analysis uh, would be seen uh, over and over again. So um, the cost, direct and indirect of maintaining para uh, parasite classes, and this might be familiar, um, although the language is, um, you know, would be different nowadays, and, but this might be familiar to um, many of you in the uh, older um, um, Roman history books. And the diversion of large portions of the imperial income to the construction and maintenance of unproductive buildings. And this is a way, uh, waste of uh, resources, waste of money. I mean, monumental buildings, nice, but um, for the analysis um, here, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, um, uh, author here, uh, this is a complete waste of um, uh, resources. Um, and this is counterproductive. And not good for the society. And also the third reason, the costs of the military organization and um, the, uh, sorry, uh, my, again, my view is blocked by uh, the bar and bureau, uh, bureaucratic uh, machine. All right, and um, the first and the second might be familiar uh, to us and the second is quite important. Um, and this, uh, and because even nowadays, uh, we still sort of glorify the monuments um, from antiquity, um, but um, he has a point here, right? Uh, the uh, um, productive, uh, productivity of these buildings. Um, but of course, um, you might come to argue that. Um, I would be happy to uh, talk about that. Um, uh, in the uh, discussion session. Um, but of course, this person talks about Rome, not just to talk about Rome, right? Like oh, most of the uh, um, authors at that time, um, they talk about Rome because they had a larger agenda. Um, so uh, according to him, all of the problems were still present in contemporary China. For example, funding was allocated to renovate a temple uh, with unproductive <laughs> use of resources um, and expand bureaucracy rather than supply the soldiers fighting against the Japanese on the front lines. Right? 
And the government officials sold large quantities of government bonds, causing the future cheapening of these bonds. So Rome, again, um, was um, brought back as, uh, from the history lesson book uh, for the uh, contemporary issues um, of China. And there's more to talk about, but um, I think I um, uh, can sort of uh, provide a conclusion here and I would be happy to elaborate uh, on uh, various issues, uh, various points, and also engage in uh, discussions in the Q&A session. So the writing of Roman history in the first half of the 20th century China was thus a site where discourse about China's past Concern over China's fate, a search for historical lessons and a close attention to European affairs and their historical precedents intricately coalesced um, from a fallen Rome to an imperialistic Rome, an almost exclusive focus on the negative lessons that can be extracted from Rome um, can be clearly traced. Thank you. Okay, shall I stop sharing my slides? I guess, well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk <laughs> and a lot of food for thought right there. But um, yes, I guess, thank you for showing your face again. <laughs> Always happy to see you. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first is from Ella Mignon. Um, was uh, Kong's model influenced by Polybius and other ancient political theorists who wrote about the Anachiclosis? Uh, and this is from Lisa, right? <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Uh, I don't think he knows about um, Polybius actually. Um, uh, and he was actually more, uh, well, I don't know whether that answers your question. <laughs> um, uh, Polybius uh, in fact has never been translated until very, very recently. Uh, and Khan was not able to read um, uh, any other language. Um, it was, a, in fact, a pity that Polybius, um, I think uh, the complete translation was still not available, um, but uh, selected translations were, uh, uh, were published a few years ago. Uh, such a pity, right, uh, for the for the study of the Roman Republican um, period. Um, but um, uh, but um, Khan was more influenced by the Japanese. Okay. If there is a lineage there, it must come from have come from uh, the uh, uh, Japanese and his uh, entrenched um, entrenched. Um, uh, fascination, I guess, or uh, root in Confucianism. Did that answer your question, Lisa? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we have a comment from Ryan Warwick and then I guess another question. Um, so I'm hearing echoes of someone like Juvenal as well, though the politics of the satires can be read in various ways. And then I'd also love to hear more about specific figures from Roman history that impressed these thinkers. I'm hoping for the Gracchi, but anyone really. Um, was, Liv was Livy as mediated through Gibbon at all their only source? So I guess. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a, a great question too. Um, and I uh, also want to say that Livy has never been translated into Chinese. <laughs> uh, even today, well, Livy's uh, book one, uh, we do have a, um, a Chinese translation book one, but just book one. Uh, and there were various efforts uh, to translate selections of Livy, but Livy as an entirety has never been made uh, fully available. Um, so the read stories, um, if we uh, talk about uh, individuals at all, uh, that would be Caesar and um, Octavian. Uh, Octavian was quite often referred to you know, by that name, not by Augustus, um, but, um, uh, but yeah, uh, Caesar and um, Octavian, but that was actually not through Livy. It was more through uh, Shakespeare. 
<laughs> Shakespeare, <laughs> Shakespeare's plays, and Shakespeare had a um, had a, a, a there was some kind of fetish. Uh, yeah, fetishization of Shakespeare in China, and, and there, there's a, um, there, there have been a lot of studies about why so. Um, but yeah, but uh, Shakespeare has an elevated status in China, and he was translated quite early on. Um, so if that answers your question, uh, so there was a, and sometimes it was difficult for people at that time to separate literature from history. Um, and uh, a lot of what they read uh, from Shakespeare uh, was taken as history. It was a Hello, different. Eric. Hello? I'm okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, there, I guess. Apologies. <laughs> ah, and Cicero, um, in fact, there was Cicero. Uh, Cicero. Um, why Cicero? Cicero was actually um, uh, uh, translated and uh, transmitted by the missionaries. Um, the missionaries uh, were trained in classical Latin, um, and Cicero belonged to their uh, stock reading materials. Now, Virgil too, but they tended not to talk too much about Virgil. Um, due to his poetic power, but um, but um, Cicero um, was one of the uh, ancient Roman writers who was um, introduced very early on. Um, but since he wrote so much, uh, uh, the selections were in fact done by the missionaries. For example, his treatise on friendship that was um, that was taught more than um, his other treaties, for example. Um, but there have been several different sets of complete translations of Cicero in Chinese now. So yeah, <laughs> would that surprise you, Ryan? <laughs> yes, responded not at all. <laughs> yeah, that's... Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so I guess um, as I'm a bit conscious of time, um, Stephanie Ann Frampton, who unfortunately had to leave a bit early, uh, my apologies that I have to go to another meeting, but I would be very interested to hear more about how the ideas of populace and the people in Chinese were used in parallel in these discussions. Mm -hmm. Ah, the uh, uh, um Karl Marx uh, talked about Graikai, the Graikai. Um, and Karl Marx liked Apian. And Apian has a positive uh, evaluation of the Graikai. Not all the ancients had a positive uh, evaluation of the Graikai, right? Um, Cicero, that's <laughs> right. maybe not. <laughs> right, right. But, um, um, but the Graikai was thought of as, um, as uh, heroes. Um, and they were, um, uh, and I think they are still thought of as heroes nowadays uh, via, uh, via, via um, Apian, via Karl Marx. I, I don't know whether that, I mean, she's not here. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that is like a very interesting line of thought. So um, yes, another, uh, question from Liang uh, Zemo. Uh, Hello, Professor Liu. I have a question about Ars Amatoria by Ovid. When it was firstly introduced to China, it was advertised as literature of romance for recreational reading, almost entirely neglecting its value in Latin literature. What's your opinion about such methods of introduction? Uh, yeah, it was um, published in 1929. Um, in fact, there is an article about um, it, that would answer your question. And it was uh, written by um, uh, Xiao Xinyao. And um, it's available uh, from, uh, if you search, uh, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll type down his, uh, her name in the, uh, Xinyao. If you search for her article, you will find it. Xiao Xinyao, and, uh, and she's actually currently translating our Sarmatoria, uh, Xinyao Xiao and uh, Miao, Yu, uh, Miao Yutian. 
Um, I mean, uh, there were, uh, the translators of course had um, his own agenda, right? And uh, he packaged uh, Asa Motoria the way to suit his own, um, to suit his own agenda. Um, and it was an era where um, sexuality and love um, and uh, relationship between men and women could be openly discussed, and which was a great thing because um, uh, and, and, uh, traditional, in the traditional um, uh, society, those things were not supposed to, <laughs> were not supposed to, <laughs> right, um, be, uh, be topics for public discussion. So his translation had um, his own social uh, value. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Um, many of the translations done at that time were not um, because those were great literature in their respective society, but because they suited, uh, they were needed. They were needed by the Chinese society. Um, um, for example, uh, Homer and tragedies were translated early on because um, they were thought of as providing audacious spirit, a kind of spirit that the society, the Chinese society needed, not because of their, you know, literary um, aura, um, but of course literary uh, status uh, provided some justification for the translation, but it was more because they were needed by the society, by the, uh, um, by the target society, um, if that answers your question. Uh, I see more questions here. Yes, so we have one from Kelly. Kelly. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for this rich talk. I'm curious as to the cultural capital of Greek and Roman classical tradition in China in the early 20th century. Why were Chinese intellectuals using Greek and Roman literature and history to make a case for their understanding of Chinese nationalism? And what was the force of using these allusions in Chinese society? Ah, that's a large question. <laughs> and I probably will um, use a small angle to, you know, to, to break that, to break in, sort of into that, um, that question. It will take an entire book, I guess, a book that I was supposed to write, but I have never written. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm behind the contract. <laughs> um, uh, there were a lot of uh, different sources for the Chinese fascination with um, the Greek word, especially the Greek word. The European Hellenism, and that was one of the major sources, uh, Romanticism, the German Hellenism, for example. Um, and if, if we use um, uh, the British uh, Hellenism as the example, Byron. Byron was, um, was a, a key figure. Um, I don't know whether people here are familiar with Byron, um, but um, he uh, was fascinated with Greece, right? Um, and he lamented the loss of a lot of the things that the ancient Greek had, right? Um, um, cultural uh, magnificence, uh, free, a free spirit, a spirit of freedom, right? Um, all of those things he thought uh, kind of were lost um, in uh, modern uh, in Greece in his time, right? And he uh, he actually fought for uh, Greek uh, freedom, right? <laughs> and he visited uh, Greece, of course, and uh, he wrote a poem about um, uh, uh, the past, Greece in the past. And that poem was, um, it, that was in the novel, that was in the, uh, uh, sorry, not novel, that was in Don Juan, right? Um, it was a poem within the, that larger piece, but it was taken out by the Chinese um, intellectuals to translate over and over again into Chinese. And there are many, many different versions of that poem. And um, there was no title for that poem in that larger piece, but um, the Chinese gave it a Chinese name, uh, Lamenting Greece, Lamenting Greece. Uh, yeah, so Greece here was seen as um, as a mirror to um, as a mirror to 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 China and its enshrined status as the origin of the West, and that was completely bought by the Chinese intellectuals. 
Um, so it was safe for the Chinese intellectuals to use Greece because you don't have to argue. Um, you don't have to argue for its superior status. I mean, it was, um, it was understood by the Europeans at that time, right? <laughs> as uh, as uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the origin um, of, the, of the West and the, the pinnacle of, um, of uh, Western cultures, uh, at least to some of the minds in Europe. So for the Chinese, uh, the, it's very economical. It's very economical to use Greece because you don't have to spend a lot of time, you know, justifying, <laughs> justifying the use of Greece. I don't know whether that answers your question, <laughs> Kelly, but that was one of the brief answers. Uh, and, and there are other, um, other additional um, uh, um, points we can talk about, but, um, but I thought that was quite important because it was very economical. Wow. <laughs> I, I hope Kelly was um, satisfied with that answer. I surely was. <laughs> so um, I guess we have one more question. I think after this, maybe we'll wrap things up, just being, making sure that we're not cutting into your time too much <laughs> this, this afternoon. <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, something that has been on my mind is the relationship that imperialism and colonialism have to how we understand and define civilization especially since you've mentioned this idea of self-orientalism, I'm wondering if you think that China's adoption of the West, um, of the West rhetoric is a form of self-colonization. Sorry, if this doesn't make sense at all, just wondering your thoughts. It makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought so too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's always tricky, right? Um, it's very tricky um, because, uh, and that, that's actually one of the reasons why I mentioned the two cases of uh, two cases to show that the Chinese uh, thinkers were in the know, right? They, they know, they know that um, self-orientalization came with self-colonization, uh, um, uh, but they, they, they were willing to take the risk and they were willing to, um, to do it because they, um, they sort of weighed the two things, right? Um, uh, and they saw more benefits if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so you, you trash your people first, right? But your purpose is to save your people. Um, it's not to colonize your people, right? But, um, but again, you, know, you could also argue that using, using the West to define your people is a way of, so it is a way of colonization, right? It's, it's, really, it's really, really tricky. Um, so then, I guess the alternative question would just be, are there, were there ways of um, sort of reforming uh, the society without, without engaging with the West, or with the Western concept? Um, do we have examples of, um, of those? I mean, they, 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 they had to sort of at that time, they had to react, right? They had to react to the West. They had to react to, uh, the invading powers. Uh, they had no choice. Uh, whether you wanted it or not, um, you, the thinkers, um, the intellectuals, the uh, opinion leaders, they sort of had to, right? They cannot bypass uh, the Western concepts, no. Because those concepts entered in uh, the diplomatic arena, right? They um, entered in the discourse between governments, there is no way, there is no way to get around them. Um, if there is no way to get around them, uh, the best you can do is to um, appropriate them, utilize them, um, but at the same time, um, be aware of the traps, right? Um, but it does have the downside because um, even nowadays, uh, the Chinese still define their people the same way. <laughs> Those, <laughs> you know, um, opinion leaders from a hundred years ago define their people. So that uh, had a huge impact. And a lot of people did not, of course, um, you know, lay people, um, they would not look at the historical background, right? They sort of bought the rhetoric and that rhetoric has a lingering effect, which is, unfortunate, um, but um, 
But yeah, I don't know whether that um, sort of answered your um, your question. I completely understand um, your um, worries there. Yeah, yeah, great question. And <laughs> obviously that balance is a very difficult one to navigate. And I think that's that comes up a lot in like Latin literature in general. I just, I've been having to read Cicero's Per Marcello recently. <laughs> Definitely came up. <laughs> but yeah, just in our wider society and contemporary society in general. But, um, so yes, I think um, that's all the time that we really have for today. But there are like lots of really great comments in the chat. Um, and I guess that was a wonderful talk and a great Q&A. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I um, had a, uh, yeah, um, I missed Lisa's comment. Rome is necessary for ideas of unification unless you are looking at the Hellenistic period, but Alexander's empire had very different nature and uh, cohesion, unification, um, chronological endurance than Rome's. I have to, yeah, that's a great point. They actually also talked about um, Alexander. Um, Alexander was in fact revered as a hero somehow. <laughs> uh, and he featured in a lot of hero, um, featured in a lot of hero stories, and, and there were uh, very little effort, there was very little effort to complicate um, Alexander. We all know that Alexander can be, you know, complicated in a variety of ways, right? But um, yeah, um, but um, Alexander's empire was also used as a failed example. Uh, of how the Greeks could not have unification. <laughs> I, sorry about that, but um, uh, uh, okay. I don't know, Lisa. Lisa, you had a great point there. That was a different case, right? A different model, but um, um, but because he failed miserably uh, to the mind of the Chinese, uh, uh, they sort of bypassed him um, while at the same time elevating Alexander as an example. He tried, but he failed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. It's complicated, right? Ryan was asking how can Gracchi and Alexander be heroes at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> and as I mentioned, it's um, it's a complicated discourse, right? Um, you know their relationship with the West um, and all the uh, uh, various components um, that they want to put together. It's it's not a linear thing, right? Um, it's it's really all over the place. It's it's complex. It's complicated. Yes, and that's um, that's why Greco and Alexander can be heroes at the same time. That's actually a great um, uh, summary for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes. Thank you so much, and for I guess, yeah, coming up with that wonderful summary of the talk. <laughs> wrap things up. <laughs> so um, yes, thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you so much, Professor Liu. That was amazing. <laughs> thank you. And Stephanie had the comment. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes. And thank you, everybody, for your wonderful comments. <laughs> thank you. All Bye, right. Good evening, or good midnight, or good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where all of uh, you are, but um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye.